So uh, thanks everyone for coming um, and, and joining us today. Um, really excited to uh, have this session with you all. And this one I think will be a little different than um, some of the others in that we're, we're doing it live. It's not a, a pre-recorded. Um, and so uh, hopefully you're all are, are having luck uh, joining the, the Zoom element. Um, I'm gonna start out with just a, a little kind of uh, overview piece um, for how we're going to use the platform with this live version, since I think it's a little different um, than some. Um, we'd like to use the polls section for questions, um, as well as a few polls throughout. So uh, that little poll section on the right hand side of your pathable screen um, near where the chat window usually is. Uh, if you look in there, there's a, a top question that uh, we'd like to just understand who we're talking with today and, and who's in the audience. Uh, then there's a few other questions that we're going to be asking throughout that I'll, I'll prompt you on as we get to them uh, throughout the session. Uh, and then down at the bottom, uh, there's a spot for questions. So um, as we go through everyone's presentation, uh, I hope you put questions into that spot there. Um, and you can uh, also give the thumbs up to questions from other folks that you like. Uh, and we can make sure we uh, address those at the end uh, when we get to our, our Q&A portion. Um, so, uh, hopefully all those tools are, are visible to everyone and, and you can submit questions to that. Um, please also feel free to use the chat to connect and engage with your fellow audience members and things like that. But if, uh, if we put questions through the poll, I think that will help, help make sure we get to them um, as we get to that point. Um, so hopefully folks are, are putting in the, the question on uh, who's attending. Um, uh, I see some coming in uh, and it's a mix of uh, advocacy and, and other developers, but uh, keep letting us know uh, who's here today so that we know who we're talking with. Um, uh, and, uh, and the first thing we're going to do um, uh, is we want to get an opportunity to hear what everyone uh, in the room is seeing in their work. Um, I think as uh, Reverend Mariama's uh, wonderful keynote yesterday spoke to, uh, in the light of everything uh, that's happening, um, these days, the protests for racial justice, the challenges we're all facing in uh, undoing the systematic racism uh, in our work and in our lives. Um, we want to know what is a challenge you're seeing? Uh, what is something you are doing? What is something uh, that we or, or everyone can do um, in their work or, or in, in their life, if you're not uh, right involved in this industry, uh, to make uh, this clean energy transition more just and inclusive? So. Uh, there's a pair of poll questions there, um, both about the hurdles um, facing, uh, you know, this kind of more equitable approach to clean energy, um, but also the, uh, the what you've been able to do or, or what you'd like to do or, or what you think uh, we collectively can do. Um, so uh, please put stuff in there. And, and our hope with this um, is that uh, over the course of this panel, we'll have a chance for all of our panelists to, to talk to those points that are coming in. Um, uh, as well as uh, provide an opportunity and, and a place for everyone to reflect and think on these ideas and uh, brainstorm on these ideas. So we're going to have another question at the end uh, to revisit this concept of, of what can you take home uh, and, and what can we uh, put forth as an action, as a next step uh, in, in this effort. So uh, I see those questions coming in, or sorry, those polls uh, coming in. Um, and please keep doing so. Um, uh, and particularly, there's kind of two there. What are the hurdles? And then the what can be done as well, because I think we want to know, uh, we want to know what ideas other people have. And it's a collective answer kind of scenario. Uh, so I'm going to start with um, a, uh, a kind of introductions uh, for, for what we're going to talk about today. Um, and then uh, our great panelists are going to go through uh, with a, a focus on a, on a particular project that they all worked on, but uh, talk through their experience and challenges in, um, in bringing a successful solar project uh, or solar projects actually to uh, low and moderate income communities. Um, and, uh, and then after uh, all the panelists have a chance to go through, we'll move on to Q&A. So um, have those questions coming in and we'll uh, look to get to them later on um, and really hope that we can uh, kind of use this live though virtual uh, session to have a little bit of kind of discussion. Um, 
So with that, uh, I guess just for my own intro, I'm Kelsey Reed. I'm a program manager at the Mass Clean Energy Center. Um, have been focusing on the Mass Solar Loan Program as one of our initiatives uh, that has helped uh, reach low and moderate income uh, people throughout the state uh, and, and help them um, pursue solar PV projects. Uh, done over 5,500 loans through that program uh, over the past uh, four years, 29, just over 2,900 of which uh, have been for low and moderate income individuals. And it's uh, one of the initiatives we're working on, but uh, I think one piece of the puzzle in uh, reaching these markets. Um, so I think uh, lots of folks in the room today um, probably understand uh, or have been focused on the challenges in expanding clean energy uh, in a manner that is inclusive and equitable. Um, and, and we want to focus uh, today on, on how this transition and, and how this kind of asset shift um, towards distributed energy is, is an opportunity as well as a challenge uh, to kind of evolve our system into one that uh, works to undo the, the longstanding systematic injustices um, and, and can make clean energy uh, something that benefits all communities. Um, as just a little stage setting, uh, we kind of wanted to highlight three kind of common perceived barriers um, that I think uh, everyone, our panelists will be speaking to uh, as they talk about reaching these low income or, or disadvantaged communities. But uh, the first, uh, that there's no interest from consumers. Uh, the second, that there's just technical challenges that are too great to overcome. Uh, and third, that there's just no path to finance these projects in any economical type of way um, or that there's credit hurdles or income hurdles um, that just make these unfeasible. Uh, and I think the, the panels today are, are all gonna be able to speak to uh, projects where those were all tackled uh, and, and overcome uh, in some ways. So um, with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, everyone who uh, is gonna be talking today. So uh, Reverend Mariama White Hammond, uh, who hopefully many of you heard uh, again with that wonderful keynote yesterday. Uh, is an advocate for ecological and social justice um, who got involved with uh, Ben Underwood and Marcel Rogers um, when she was looking uh, to bring solar to the roof of her church and, and to other houses of worship uh, here in Boston. Uh, Ben's company, Resonant Energy, uh, helped develop and install the solar uh, for those churches. Uh, and then Sunwell, where uh, Marcel works, uh, helped finance those systems. Um, and so uh, our hope is that uh, each of these three panelists, uh, Reverend Mariama, Ben, and Marcel, can bring a kind of different perspective uh, to that, those projects and that work, uh, that of an organizer and an advocate who wants to bring these technologies into their community, uh, that of an installer trying to make these projects work, uh, and that of a financier trying to you know, find a way to finance these projects. Um, they work together on the Interfaith Solar Project uh, and a number of other projects uh, and policies uh, to help bring solar in to low-income communities uh, and communities of color uh, and illustrate the kind of intersectionality of environmental, racial, economic justice work um, that we, I think, all would like to tackle. Um, they're gonna focus uh, on the kind of ways in which organizations and individuals can step up and, and think differently about their work uh, to bring about this kind of systematic change that we uh, think we can see and think we can uh, enact. Uh, so with that, uh, Reverend Mariam, I'm going to kick it over to you to start uh, with three kind of prompt questions, but how you came to be involved uh, in this work. What was the process like from your particular, particular perspective on it all? What were the challenges you experienced and, and how did you find the solutions to that? Uh, and then finish with that kind of action and action item perspective. Uh, what are the kind of two key lessons or recommendations you want to share with others who are looking to accomplish a project like this. So take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so um, just to give a little quick overall context. So um, we were a, we were part of, um, and this is a church I was at before, before I was a pastor when I was the Minister for Ecological Justice at Bethel AME Church. And um, Bethel, um, we have a green team or have I'm not, I'm obviously no longer part of, it, but um, I'm pastoring a new congregation, but um, there was a green team and folks had worked on a variety of different things. We had had an audit done of the congregation. We had done some work um, to bring um, mass saves to, to energy efficiency. So there were a number of things that the congregation was already doing. And 
like many things, we had a smaller crew of us who were diehard and committed. And then we were trying to figure out how do we make um, being green as easy and accessible for the rest of the congregation as possible. Because what we found is that if we made it easy for people to do, people not only did it, they started getting excited and we could kind of see other things build off of it. Um, so, that, you know, if people have to go on and sign up for an energy efficiency audit on their own, maybe it wouldn't happen. But if we could invite uh, a provider in to sign up a bunch of people at the same time, um, we saw a major uptick in the number of folks in our congregation who are interested. And so um, Bethel is a predominantly um, black congregation um, in, based in Jamaica Plain. And, you know, of course there are the stereotypes that, you know, um, communities of color do not care about um, green issues. And that, we found that to be entirely untrue. Um, there were different reasons that people came. Some people came for the energy efficiency or wanted to get and learn more because they wanted to save money on their bill. Uh, some people were really excited and wanted to do it because they saw it as part of their faith or a way to get in, engaged. So we saw people come and get involved for multiple different reasons. But um, again, the big work for the green team was how do we make this accessible? So we got to a point where we really wanted to do solar. And again, um, we wanted to do solar at the church, both to save the church money and to make the church more uh, or more uh, in engaged with renewable energy. But also because we thought if we could install it on the church, that will make other folks more interested, more willing to look at what they could do in their own homes. So we first started out trying to do it ourselves and there were some huge issues around financing. Um, figuring out how we would be able to pay for it. We are not a church with an endowment. Um, at the time that we first started looking at it, um, some of the programs that exist now didn't exist. And so if you, you know, we were considered quote unquote commercial in many instances, a lot of this at this time, there weren't as many things set aside for nonprofits. Um, and so, you know, finding $60,000 laying around was not something that was sort of an easy thing for us to do. And so we tried to figure out ways to crowdsource and different things. But the truth is that in the early stages, when the church really first looked at solar, financing was a core challenge. How do we do something if we have to pay most of the cost up front? Um, and so that, that barrier, um, kind of had us move away from the solar piece and work on other things that we, we figured were lower hanging fruit. Um, but then we got a call from a sister congregation, Second Church um, in Dorchester, which is not far from us, from Bethel. Bethel and, and Second Church are about um, two miles, I think, apart from each other. Um, and Second Church had also been interested in um, getting uh, solar panels and but by, again by themselves it becomes harder because then you're going as an individual um, congregation and at that time again resonant didn't exist at that time that um, they were having some of the same challenges of like how are we going to do this by ourselves unless we have the money to pay up front so second church um, thankfully one of their members um, or a couple um, of, of their members were part of Co-op Power. And um, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Alphonse or, or Olive. Olive and Alphonse are married and, and are part of Co-op Power and were interested and started to have conversations with Co-op Power about my, what might be possible. Um, and, and what everybody agreed is this, will be, this project will be easier to get done if it's multiple congregations than if it's each congregation negotiating on, an, on its own. And so what I think was really powerful for us, it's, it's created a relationship between the congregations um, that still stand, some folks still know each other and stay in conversation. Um, later on, um, other con we started reaching out to other congregations. Who do you know? Who do you think might be interested? Um, early on, we had about, I think it was a, about 17 congregations that we approached and had some level of interest. Um, churches are interesting. They learning how to navigate their structures. Um, for those who don't know it, it feels like maybe navigating government structures or like, how do we figure out who makes the decisions here? Um, you have to get like 15 different committees to sign on sometimes because it's a, there's a building committee, but then there's a finance committee, but then there's like a green team. So, you, you know, there, there's a lot of work 
of getting a, a congregation engaged. It's a little bit of a community organizing project. Um, and I, I saw Ben laughing because Ben would be like, so wait, which group do we have to talk to next? And I was like, now we need to get this team um, signed off. And um, what was beautiful for us, at least on our side, is that it was actually, again, for different reasons, some for finance, some for um, efficiency, some for, for all different kinds of reasons, people got excited, including our young people. Our young people were um, really good. A couple of them um, had parents who are on some of those core committees, and I know they had conversations with them. So um, getting the congregation excited actually really wasn't that hard. Um, a lot of conversations, but um, viable. And, and getting other congregations to consider it. Um, Actually, we did a, I think we did a decent job in the beginning. Um, where we hit some roadblocks, is <laughs> we were moving along and partway through our, the project, our state changed its um, solar regulations in a way that nearly killed the project. Um, first of all, we ended up having to put more money up front, um, not as much as we would have if we had bought the solar panels outright. But we had, we couldn't structure, there were some things that needed to be ha done with our roofs or with our buildings that we couldn't um, structure into the financing of the project the same way we had originally done. Um, the state also reduced the size of the project we could do because our original idea, which was really exciting to us, was that we actually could have installed, particularly on both roofs. Both of us have big, these old churches that were built when like everybody thought it was great to have like these massive, massive high ceiling, huge roofs. We could have created enough solar, not just to power the church, but to be able to create a part of the plan of the um, roof that would have been a community shared solar project, allowing us to offer lower um, cost solar through resonance. Sort of resonant would have taken that portion and people would have been able to buy into a community solar project that would have reduced their bills. Because of the changes at the state house, um, suddenly we needed more money up front. We also could not do nearly as large of a project, which of course I think people on here will know that would, that affected our economies of scale and made it um, a little bit more challenging. Um, so what I will say is this, on, on the church side, once we'd already got started, people were like, no, we're gonna figure this out, right? So we thankfully, because we had the level of buy-in that we had, we had other people willing to step in and figure out how we could work, um, work it out. But the, downside is that a number of the churches who had not moved as far through the process had started with one set of numbers and and suddenly the numbers were less favorable than they had been and of course that made it really hard because if you're in the middle of trying to sell something to people and get them excited about it and you start with one set of numbers and then you say actually the benefits are going to be significantly lower Right, it started looking riskier because of the difference between what we were expecting to pay in our electricity bills. And um, I won't go into all, I'm sure there are many people on this who understand net metering and all of the regulations and all of the changes that happened and how all of those um, together added up to some real problems. And there were things in the bill that I think our um, elected officials admitted later, they didn't even know what those really meant. So I'm like, who wrote this bill? My guess is that the utilities wrote a good portion of that bill um, and found ways to stick in um, provisions that um, favored solar that they created did not favor solar um, that uh, was done um, at organizations like ours. So um, what I will say is the, 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 the change in regulation slowed our project down and it, it made us lose engagement of some congregations that I think we would have been able to bring in. Um, but the flip side of that is um, after that our church was um, pretty engaged and we um, started talking with other folks and helped to um, we were part of introducing solar legislation at the state house um, because our um, uh, state senator the state senator that represented the church in that and the surrounding community um, we had already told her that this was going to happen and then we were able to tell her hey do you know what that that change did to us um, second church was able to do the same. And one of the good things is that their, their state rep had not been one of the people paying attention closely to solar, but at the um, groundbreaking for our, our project, when we finally pushed through, we told the story about how much we had had um, 
to fight and, and how the state house had not been helpful to our efforts. Um, and we told him that we would like to have a deeper conversation. Um, and he was there at the groundbreaking. And he said, I, I'm clear that I'm gonna get a call at my office. And for the first time he weighed in on solar legislation. This was a legislator who had never really been active on this issue before. So, um, you know, I will stop there because I know other folks have to go and there'll be places for questions. But, you know, I, I, as is all often the case, you know, the personal is the political and, uh, and we um, recognize that our lived experience was deeply connected with a larger conversation. Um, and for me personally, and some of the other members of that folks and now members of my current congregation, we've stayed pretty engaged around issues of legislation um, because we saw how it directly impacted our ability to get a project done or not. It directly impacted the bottom line and it directly impacted to this day, we were never able to complete the community shared solar project that would have given lower income electricity um, to uh, a lower cost electricity to many of the lower income families in the neighborhood surrounding the church. So um, there's still quite a bit of work to be done. Um, and it's been great. I have to say, when I testify at the state house and start talking about how it impacted our church, it does, I think people listen a little bit more. I think people are a little surprised. Uh, th there are some usual suspects they're used to hearing from, but to talk about a congregation that organized and did something and the state house stood in their way, um, um, I think it, it has gotten people to just think a little bit more differently. Thanks, Reverend Mariana. Um, I think that's a, a fantastic point about the kind of ability of a project, uh, a unique project like this to not only be the project in itself, but um, to spur the action and, and spur the notice uh, of others uh, who can help uh, in the sector. Um, one thing I, I wanna make sure we get to before is uh, what are your, your, two, your two lessons? So I actually cut myself off because I realized I had run over my time. But um, so I think um, the two, you know, to underscore, one is really about the pit around organizing. I think that sometimes people see these projects as, well, we just need to get some panels up and that's going to get a renewable energy. And that's great. I'm not disagreeing with that. But for instance, we chose the, the roof side that we wanted to go through when we knew we couldn't do the whole thing. One of the big advantages to the side of the roof that we chose is it was the most visible side. It was a side that people walked in on their way going to church. We could have used, there was a much bigger one. And, you know, we could have, that, that could have been a viable possibility. We could have put it on another building. There were, other, there were other options, but we, we wanted to make sure that people could see um, those panels. And I laugh because I, you know, when people will say, yeah, I remember people at the church saying, you know, our solar panels, people who had not really done that much, but I was like, I want you to own these. I want you to feel connected to them um, because I think if um, we really want renewable um, energy to grow, we need a lot more people that feel ownership and connection to it. And so really looking at each project as an organizing opportunity is really he huge. And then the second piece is really, um, I think it's connected, obviously, looking at the policy side of things and um, really asking questions about who's benefiting and who is not and whether or not the regulations that we're creating are opening doors or closing them. And particularly, I, we should not open the doors equally for everyone. I want to name that. We need to open the doors more stridently for those who, the, who many other doors are closed for. Um, and I, I find far too often um, there is a the rising tides will raise all boats mentality and solar like oh my gosh solar's so amazing so we can't talk about labor standards and we don't need to talk about this because it's just so amazing it's like great unto itself um and we need to have the, this industry this community this movement needs to ask some deeper questions so we were really excited um to be able for instance to hire we were insistent on hiring um a group to do the installation of our panels that reflected the community that our church lives in, right? So the, the four person was from Hyde Park, which is the neighborhood of Jake, like literally like right near the Hyde Park line. Um, there were mostly folks of color and that mattered to us because the industry is overwhelmingly seen as white and overwhelmingly, you know, um, disconnected from the communities of color. And that has a lot to, to play into why there's not nearly as much uptick. So both, you know, using it as an organizing opportunity, bringing everybody that you can in, and then also looking at all the policies 
um, um, both on the hiring practices and even the kinds of panels that we had, we looked at like where they're being manufactured and all of those things. And I, I thank Resonant for really doing a good job of giving that analysis. And, and then all the way up to, we were able to go testify at the State House um, about much bigger policies and we're still fighting on them and we can have a conversation about that um, in the question and answer. Well, thank you, Reverend Graham. Uh, ben, let's move on to you. Same questions. Great. Um, and um, yeah, if you don't mind, could you repeat the prompt again quickly? Absolutely. Uh, so the three ones are how you came to be involved, uh, what was the process like from, from your point of view, and, and what were the kind of key challenges or changes you experienced? How did you find the solutions for those? And then finishing up with those uh, two key lessons or recommendations. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, um, you know, uh, Reverend Miami did a great job of um, summarizing, um, you know, some of the main parts of um, the, the process, and what all happened. Um, one thing she mentioned um, that uh, really jumped out to me and that stays with me is uh, that, that idea of the personal being political um, and, um, and then also the, um, uh, I think the idea of, of getting more people involved being a critical part um, of, um, you know, one of the key learnings or the most important things that, that um, you know, she learned coming out of the process. Um, and I think that idea of um, how this project ended up encompassing um, a, a lot more people, um, the work of a lot more people, um, and, and the lives of a lot more people um, than a typical solar project would um, is, um, is probably the most important part of it to me. Um, uh, so, you know, quickly the, the story of how I got involved with the project. Um, Reverend Mariama mentioned, uh, mentioned Co-op Power. Um, so that was a group that I was working with uh, at the time, um, and um, a couple of members of Co-op Power, Alphonse and Olive, um, had actually been working to get solar on the roof of Second Church, um, the other church that she mentioned, for like five years. Um, they had gotten the roof replaced. Um, it's a perfect south-facing roof, um, new asphalt shingles. Um, you, you really couldn't ask for a better roof to put a solar array on, um, and, and had encountered the exact same barrier that Reverend Mariama mentioned. Um, and also important to note that um, Second Church in Dorchester is uh, the congregation is uh, primarily black uh, folks, and, um, and and so I think um, you know running into these barriers, there was um, you know consistently of oh you know you can't you can't take out this loan um, or you don't qualify for this type of solar financing, and um, and that was something that Alphonse had been motivated to to fixed for like five years. And I still remember the meeting, we went to a co-op power meeting um, where he and um, Pastor Price, um, uh, the pastor of Second Church in Dorchester were talking about it. And, um, and that's where they really had the idea of, um, you know, if it's hard to get just one, um, one roof, uh, to get financing for just one roof, if that's too small of a, of a deal, right, to get banks or financiers to look at, um, <laughs> Pastor Price is like, I have a list of 250 churches in the greater Boston area um, that like, probably would want to do something like this. Like, he's like, you're telling me that, that we don't have to pay money up front and we could, you know, we could save money in our bills. It's like, this is probably something that other churches are going to want to do. Um, <clears throat> and so I don't remember if it was through that list or otherwise that we got um, in touch with Reverend Mariama. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, maybe you could fill that in. But um, so we started asking around and, um, and uh, you know, it was in the course of that process that um, my uh, my current business partner Isaac and I um, decided to um, you know that, that it would make the most sense to actually split off from Co-op Power just to focus on the project development um, aspect of it. The project development um, I, I know can be um, is a sort of an abstract term, but it really is just you know where we're, we're focused is bringing together all the different stakeholders who need to be involved um, to make the project happen. Um, and, um, and so for us, that included not just the churches where the arrays were going to be located, but um, also uh, installers to build the systems um, and getting in touch with other churches to make it a larger project, and, and then critically, um, the financing for it, which Marcel will speak to next. Um, and, and it's not a, um, you know, it's not a given that even with a, a large group of arrays that we're going to do, in this case, it ended up being four separate arrays, um, 
and um, and about 100 kilowatts. Um, most finances only want to look at uh, projects um, that are, you know, I would say like larger than 500 kilowatts. So even with four churches, we are we are at um, one fifth of the size, or like 20% of the size of a um, deal that most finances would ever want to look at. And then to add to that, um, most finances they don't like projects that have a lot of people associated with it. Most finances like projects with the minimum possible number of people. Um, and I'd be interested to hear, you know, at some point if their response is to the folks, um, like, you know, who's in the audience and who's listening. Do we have people with project finance experience? But, like, you know, one way to get a project financer to run out of the room is to say, oh, and we have five committees here who are ready to decide how they're going to engage with this project. Um, and, and it creates a structural barrier to, um, to what types of entities can participate in solar and can get the benefits of solar. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that um, that's one critical learning from this is that just in how we think about project finance um, as a default, that, that creates structural barriers um, to which types of projects can, can be financed. Um, you look at the, the most popular kinds of projects in, in the state right now, and it's, um, it's large ground-mounted projects, um, generally in the western part of the state, um, where you can just negotiate a site lease with maybe one property owner. Um, and, and that's kind of it. And then you have um, control of the site and you can build a large array, et cetera. Um, and I think what that misses is, um, and I suppose this is the other, you know, the other critical learning for me is that, um, that, that you, you actually lose out on some really important value um, if that's your entire thesis. If, if you're trying to create the simplest, most straightforward project, and this is something that Reverend Mario Abbott said, your attitude is, Let's just do the largest project we possibly can for as cheaply as possible, and a rising tide will raise all boats, and, and solar is good no matter what. What's going to happen is that you're actually, through that mentality, favoring um, a certain kind of project. And it's projects that benefit uh, large investors, um, large landowners, um, and, um, and large construction firms that are able to do projects like that. And um, actually leaves most people out of this expanding economy that um, we all are here to talk about, right? It's like why a lot of you are probably at this conference is, what does this economy look like once it starts to involve more people? Um, and so it's fascinating to me and really exciting to see, um, you know, um, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris start to include more environmental justice language and their climate proposals. But I think that this project is, is sort of what that looks like in practice, is that it, you have to involve multiple committees of people. Um, and, and, you know, by working more broadly, like Reverend Mariam had said, um, we have a community of folks who now care about solar um, and who are bought in on solar and, and invested in solar that um, would not have been um, without each group, um, starting with Reverend Mariama and the other churches who are involved, but including Resident and including Sunwell, without us leaning in a little bit to make that project work. I mean, it required a different mentality um, to how people normally think about it. So I hope that's one takeaway is, um, you know, for, for me anyway, we didn't do anything that radical. Um, you know, we, 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 made, we each made incremental steps or did something a little bit different, you know, and I think for Resin it was, okay, we're not going to focus on one church, we're going to work with five churches at the same time. Um, and, and for Rev. Mariama, having the green team, you know, getting the folks at the church motivated, these are incremental steps forward. Um, and, and for Sunwell, thinking about investing in a different way um, that's not as exclusive, not as automatically exclusive. Um, so I hope that the folks listening can sort of hear that and think like there's, there's small actions that you can take that by themselves, um, you know, don't work, but that if you can find good partners and people who are also willing to lean forward with you, um, then you can help to create that new economy and help create um, a, more just, um, uh, a more just industry um, for us all to work in. Um, so um, I hope that's, is that responsive to all the questions, Kelsey? Yeah, I think that was great. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, and one final thing I'll say just to sort of set, set Marcel up a little bit. Um, it's just uh, <laughs> Marcel originally worked with residents, so Marcel was, was actually has been involved with this project both on the development side to some extent and then, you know, it has a direct experience with, with Sunwell. So he brings that perspective, but, um, but just, just very quickly, as far as Sunwell goes, um, <laughs> something I, I remember is, um, you know, is, is like I would always be talking with John and other folks at Sunwell who, who were like, um, yeah, it's like, you know, we're raising this money, like um, it's, it's uh, you know, to, to finance these projects, um, and it was with PPAs, um, 
and and it was like this like hail mary to to see if they could actually raise enough money and um and of course ultimately they were able to 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 get it all um and um you know it was um it was only later that i i guess i i found out um just how directly involved every person in Sunwell had been it was like this like everybody at Sunwell was was involved with raising that money at the same time um and you know, and other firms, I don't think would have done that. Um, and, and so that that sort of collective effort happening in the financing part, um, I'll just say, is to cue Marcella um, was something that really stood out to me for how Sunwell works. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, so before we move on to Marcella, I just want to remind everyone: um, put your questions in in the poll section. There's a, a poll for submit questions here, and uh, we want to make sure we we hear from you all. And, and have our panelists speak to the topics and ideas that you're interested in. So uh, go ahead and submit those whenever you're ready and, and we'll get to those during the Q&A portion. Um, but so uh, Marcel, same question, just want me to repeat the prompts or? Uh, I'll, I'll try to wing it. I might pause and, and ask you to repeat some. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, as, as Ben actually mentioned, um, I, I started off at, at Resonant and, and now kind of um, I'm working on at, Sun, at Sunwell to kind of do have um, both, both perspectives and both sides there. Um, but um, I, I think that's, that's also just what makes this particular project um, so, so much more interesting is just that natural overlap between um, the missions of all of these organizations, um, including kind of the interfaith organizations, Sunwealth, Resonant Energy, all of those involved. Um, to make this this project happen, um, that that massive overlap is is really what pulled us together um, to 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 get it done. Um, and I'll say too that from uh, Sunwell's perspective, um, the kind of the origin story, I'm sort of say of, of Sunwell and what we were seeing kind of at the time when when Sunwell was created is that there are these two big mega trends, um, if you will, that of uh, kind of going across the uh, country across the the industry and that first mega trend um actually ben kind of first explained this to me and he he was the one who, who referred to this as a, a donut hole um so if you think about um solar and where the investments are going um at that time period a lot of investment was funneled into wealthy residential um uh, small scale solar projects or kind of big utility um, investment grade type projects and um, not a lot of thought was being put at all into small scale sol commercial solar projects, which is um, what these uh, interfaith um, solar projects um, would, would be considered here. And we at Sunwell saw and still continue to see this, a huge potential here and working with houses of worship like Bethel Amy, like Circum Church of Dorchester, other nonprofit organizations, affordable housing providers, municipalities, all of these different types of organizations. Um, they've kind of they have large roofs, they have large parking lots, they have large electric loads. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of potential here for uh, a solar project. Um, and yet there were, um, as Ben and Reverend Marmion mentioned, um, just historically these um, types of organizations and communities have been overlooked for a, a variety of, of reasons. Um, but then that kind of gets into my, my the, the second mega trend, um, if you will, of, of how um, uh, at which Sunwealth um, operates, and that's um, the rise of impact investing. Um, so absent federal and state incentives and stimulation, um, uh, kind of additional in addition to what's already there, there is a general and growing interest amongst more and more people to put their capital work and in investments that align with their values. And those values, of course, being protecting and stewarding the planet um, and, and caring for people. Um, these are values that religious organizations like Bethel AME and Second Church um, have had since the beginning of their time. And um, these are the values too that um, the investors, when, when Ben was talking about all the different people at Sunwealth and, and kind of investors that had their, their hands um, here and trying to make this work and make the capital and financing work out. Um, these are the values that um, really kind of resonate um, with us and, and motivate us and um, are, are, are necessary to um, ensure that um, the, the this transition this clean um, energy transition um, is 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 just and equitable um, and of, of course now too in, in the wake of um, two global pandemics here um, this the, this interest in impact investment is is only increasing 
Um, and, and so naturally there is this big overlap and, and fit here between resident energy and all these um, the organizations here to help figure out um, the financing and um, it, that would make these, these projects happen. Um, it's also kind of interesting in that this, this was our definition at the time of community solar. Um, this was the first portfolio of projects that Sunwell had financed where we do have um, a bunch of different entities, different churches that are um, benefiting from the electricity savings um, and um, the amount of people, the different parties, the time it took to kind of educate, develop, finance and build these projects. Um, it, it really did take everyone, kind of the whole village to make these projects a success. And for us, um, that, that was community solar. Um, so I guess on to maybe some of the, the challenges um, that, that, that were overcome. And I, I would say for us, it's from that financing perspective, it's really just overcoming a perception of, of risk and the years um, of practices that have shaped traditional solar financing to create that, that donut hole effectively. Um, if you think about the, the big institutions and banks that have kind of defined the way investment works and uh, solar investment looks, um, we see that early on it was decided that a good investment um, is, is one that's of a certain size, um, as Ben and Reverend Mariano pointed out. Um, smaller projects uh, are, are seen as maybe being having higher transaction costs and it takes um, a lot more work um, in order to achieve kind of at the same financial return at that pace that um, maybe if you've got more of a kind of a Wall Street framework and, and looking at a, a project, um, then um, kind of the, our, our approach um, at Sunwealth. Um, we're I, typically also um, investors are looking at kind of FICO scores, S&P Moody ratings. And um, ironically, if you kind of think about the, the definition um, from, from that term, uh, from that framework of what a good um, investment in a utility scale project would be, you might, might be thinking of um, like PG&E, um, the, the utility company in California as, as an off taker for this type of project. But if you think of like PG&E, they, they ultimately failed. So even that is, is just not a good proxy for um, what defines a, a good project. And this approach to financing is also just inherently part of the problem, the reason why equity in the clean energy sector, as with all sectors for that matter, um, continues to be a, a challenge. Um, so at the community scale, we're not talking about investing billions of dollars at the speed, at the expected returns that the big large market players um, on, on Wall Street might be thinking about. And that, that framework just doesn't work for us. Um, and what we care about is strengthening the local economy, creating that long-term savings, um, for the power purchase. And so our approach just inherently has to be different. And it is like the, the underwriting process is actually quite simple. First and foremost, um, we care, does the um, agreement provide clear and meaningful savings and benefit to the power purchaser? Um, so uh, another way to think about it, um, there, there are no like hidden fees or escalators, no like, um, I think typically what would be cited here, I think about like a, um, a cable provider who, who might be coming in and then um, you have lock in this low entry rate and maybe a year thereafter, um, the, the rate, the amount that you're paying on a monthly basis just skyrockets. Um, so like one of the first things we do in looking at a project is making sure that there's none of that language, that the savings are very clear to the organization that they're gonna be saving for the long term. Um, and then the second um, big way that we uh, kind of approach underwriting projects is, um, Yes, we do look at kind of the, the financial statements and the, take a look at that traditional kind of financing metric, but, but then also we, we have a very pragmatic common sense approach to the underwriting and we ask ourselves questions like, is, does the organization pay their electric bill? Um, right, we're not, we're not underwriting a loan here for some new expense. We're just, we're underwriting whether or not this organization is going to pay their electric bill. Um, and um, of course, providing savings uh, off of their electricity is just another way to mitigate the risk of them not paying the electric bill. And then another question would be, what's, what's the history of that organization within the community? Um, and you know, are, are they gonna be around for, for the long term? Um, we're, we're kind of underwriting the building itself as much as the organization. Um, Cause if you think about 
Um, a, I mean, Second Church of Dorchester being a great example of all of the different um, uh, faith organizations that operate out of there, of the um, after school programs, of the, I mean, lots of houses of worship are also kind of double as um, community service type or um, places where community services um, happen, whether it's AA meetings or um, kind of food pantries. There, there's just a lot of additional value um, that's not just reflected on a balance sheet that a community organization such as a house of worship um, provides. So uh, I, I guess that's all to say that um, in evaluating a project, we're, we're not just looking at it and from the same framework and lens um, that, that leads to the reason why many of uh, why it took so many years um five years as ben said for second church of dorchester to 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 find the right financing partner to find the right solution that's going to work for them um there's just a more pragmatic way to to go about it um and then the last question kelsey that was just around big takeaways right yeah two two takeaways for for other folks uh thinking about a project yeah um I'll piggyback a bit off of what both Ben and, and Mariama said. And um, maybe just the first takeaway is that there's no, there's no magic really. Um, like it would be great if uh, this were like an infomercial where you could say, yeah, it's as easy as one, two, three. And then um, we have a very prescribed list of, of actions to take to, to get the work done. But um, the reality is that the, the challenges that we've identified, um, they're, they're systemic they're systemic, they're, they're institutional, they're um, like the roots are, are deeply um, seated and um, it, it, it takes um, time and effort and to, to, to get it done. Um, and it takes the, the community, the all hands on deck, so to say, um, to, 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 to resolve and kind of begin to, to do this work. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's not to paint like a, a daunting picture, but these these are success stories after all. Like we, the work has been done; it continues to be done um, every every day um, by by Resonant Energy and kind of our partners in, in accomplishing it. Um, but I think the important thing here is just to get started and um, to have a uh, maybe like a rational and pragmatic approach and understanding um, that the, of, of what exactly the, the project is and what are kind of the traditional ways of looking at a problem and what are some ways that would be um, maybe a little more applicable to, to the, the situation at hand. And then as a second takeaway, um, I suppose in the absence of this, this magic, what's most important then is just to have um, the, right, the right partners that are gonna have that, that will and that determination, that leadership to get the work done, to go knock on the steakhouse, uh, steakhouse state house, um, to you know, make make sure that the policies in place are also going to um, support uh, this this work here that needs to be done. Um, at the end of the day, our goals are are completely aligned. We're we're providing access to meaningful savings for the community. Um, we're contributing to mitigating climate change um, through clean energy and carbon reductions. We're for, we're we're thinking about. Um, increasing participation in the clean energy economy by creating um, jobs within uh, for solar businesses. Um, uh, we're also, I think, just serving and providing hope and inspiration. Um, uh, there, there are many stories that come out of this since, since Reverend Mariama mentioned the one um, with Rep Holmes. Um, I'll also say that um, one of the things that stuck with me was he, he kind of uh, gave a big speech and at the end of it pointed to um, Second Church um, and, and said, you know, Resonant Energy and then the whole team here did such a great job that you don't even really notice that the panels are up there on the roof. Um, and I think that's just uh, very powerful for me in, in two ways. One is because it's, it's normalizing clean energy. Um, it, you see it everywhere um, now, but then also it's, it's normalizing clean energy within that community within Codman Square. Um, and um, that just, again, serves as, as further kind of hope and inspiration to um, continue the, the movement and make it as inclusive as possible um, and as needed. Excellent. Thank you, Marcel. I, I should probably be transparent that I also am an advisor to Sunwell, <laughs> which came out of, uh, working to create to figure out how, how to raise that all, all that money. I think Marcel mentioned 
you know, most churches don't have FICO scores. We had, we, Bethel had an audit, but most churches don't have audits. So it, even creating the materials, we were like scrambling to figure out what are the materials we can create for investors so that they can understand how houses of faith operate because they don't have the same sort of metrics um, often that, that companies would have. Um, so yeah, so out, out of that, we kept conspiring and I've sort of stayed involved. <laughs> In, in, in Sunwell since then. Perfect, that was uh, excellent because my question was gonna be if Ben or Mary of Mariama had anything to comment about uh, the other presentations. So you beat me to it, uh, Mariama. Uh, but if uh, Ben, if you have anything to- I think to I might add um, quickly is um, uh, just that the, um, the, the work is sort of on, ongoing, especially on the policy side, um, and, and that, um, you know, starting with uh, Rep. Russell Holmes, who, who Marcel mentioned, who represents uh, the district that has Second Church, um, Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz, who represents um, uh, Rep. Mariama's district, or, or the district that had um, uh, Bethel AME. Um, there's, um, I think, starting to increasingly see momentum around that, um, and, and that's now, which is, um, I would say, tell me if I'm wrong, is it four years after the, the completion of those projects? Um, gosh, it's something like that. Um, and starting to really see traction, um, you know, of these um, ideas. So, so I think a couple critical things, but um, traction around the idea of uh, having the value of net metering credits for these mid-sized projects um, not be limited and not be reduced um, by this utility-friendly legislation that came out that Reverend Mariam mentioned. And I think that this is the first legislative session that those ideas that, um, that this coalition and the group that's on the panel today was instrumental in introducing to the legislature uh, four years ago are now starting to come to, a, to fruition. And I think actually have a really good chance of uh, being passed in the current uh, session. Um, environmental justice language um, uh, being part of the law um, in Massachusetts um, is, is for the first time ever, this is huge, been included in a bill introduced by the House. Um, and when that, um, when that amendment was, was um, proposed, it was the only amendment of many that got the entire chamber to apply. Um, and so it's like, I think the, the traction is, is really starting to, to happen. Um, and um, I, there were times when I was discouraged. Um, like I wasn't sure that, you know, I felt like we had like built these projects and then it felt like we were yelling into the wilderness a little bit. Um, and I, I don't know, I feel very encouraged by what I'm seeing now um, on the legislative level and also at the regulatory level. Um, the, this group, including Sunwealth and, and Resident, have been successful in like, actually getting meetings with the DOER, the, the agency that regulates solar projects, um, to help make projects like this work more easily. So that's just one other thing that I guess jumping off of what both Reverend Miami and myself said is we, we did a type of project that had not been done before. Um, that took extra effort on all of our parts, but it was nothing too radical. Like Marcel said, there's no magic to it. Um, we, we're not geniuses, right? I mean, I think, you know, obviously good, good partners to work with, but there's nothing that special about it. We went a little bit farther. We created a project that had not been created before. And from that, we found out um, what policy changes needed to happen in a very practical way. Um, and I think it's that practical information that can only come from actually attempting the project and actually doing the project um, that has led to uh, changes that I think are, are going to be successful and going to actually be helpful. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a takeaway for, for me and, and I'd like folks in the, the session to consider is like, don't wait for the policy to be perfect. The policy is never going to be perfect. There's never going to be, a, you know, it's not going to support things like this. Do the project first or, or try to do the project and really put the effort into it and then find out how the policy needs to change. Um, and and that, that, that dialogue loop of information needs to, you know, needs to happen. Thanks, Ben. Um, uh, that is going to dovetail excellent for me. So uh, just as I guess a reminder, um, go ahead and submit questions uh, to the poll session. There's a couple coming in that we'll be able to get to, but uh, we'll move on to the Q&A now. Um, and so uh, we do want to hear from you all. Uh, there's also a note in the chat uh, that for people in the Zoom uh, portion, you have to go back to Pathable um, to, to find the, the poll section and the chat. So I uh, just want to make sure you all um, can, go, can go find that page uh, and, and put in those questions there. There's no chat uh, right within the Zoom uh, functionality here. Um, 
But uh, dovetailing uh, off your point, Ben, uh, one of our first questions, um, what are the most important policy changes that we need? It sounds like there's a few kind of in the works right now um, that maybe you want to highlight, but also are there, is there something that's kind of key and missing from any of your uh, points of view? So I, I would say um, I, I agree with Ben that things have been shifting and we still have to do some more to make sure that the rubber meets the road. Um, so um, our Department of Energy Resources is part of the Department of Public Utilities. I just call them the Department of Utilities because they forget the public side of it a lot. And that's a part of why I think we need to get more people involved. I mean, I think, I think um, it is easy to feel like, oh my gosh, I just need to get this project done. But the reality is, um, I think we all recognize that solar has to grow. And so then we, therefore we all have to take some responsibility for how that needs to happen. Um, and so I do think um, because we keep pushing again and again, um, we're, we're getting more traction and are being heard, but there's still a lot of challenges. So our Department of Public Utilities tends to hire people out of the energy field who come in with all those same biases and sort of, you know, sort of um, narrow ways of thinking. Um, and I really wish that the department itself would like be more expansive and help the staff to be more expansive. Um, that doesn't happen. So every single meeting you have with them, you're trying to push their like way of thinking. Um, uh, we often have to push our legislature's way of thinking because as I mentioned with that bill, I know they didn't write that bill because a number of them, nobody seemed to understand. Um, there was a piece around the size of our project that they didn't even know they had restricted, right? And so I think this question of, um, if, if I would say more than one specific policy, it's a change in lens and frame. Um, really getting people to ask the question, who benefits, who loses, what who are we are we making it easiest for the people that already have the easiest time or are we removing every barrier for the people that have the hardest time accessing it um and so i think you know we have had to learn i've had to learn more of the technical side of things so that i can do some of that analysis but mostly i you know we stay in pretty constant contact when we're on when it comes policy time um the Green Justice Coalition and Resonant and SunWealth and um, there are a few other groups are having conversations to say, what's your analysis? How do, you see, how do we see this hitting the ground? How do we, vote solar is part of that. How do we craft the narrative so that our legislature and um, people in the D D DPU actually understand the impact of their decision? Because unfortunately, my experiences, they actually didn't spend any time thinking about the impact of the decision on low-income communities. Now, I want to get to the point where they ask that question themselves, where we don't have to have a bad policy come out, then we do the analysis, then we go meet with them, then they say, oh my gosh, we didn't realize that. And then we give some suggestions, and then they pretend like they listen to them, and then they come out with the same policy they had before. And then we have to say, no, we already gave you some suggestions. So there's a whole push and pull. Um, and I think the truth is, the more you push them, the more they're like, hey, maybe we should think about their things up front so we don't have to have people come into our meetings and protest against us, or I don't have to get a call from some legislator telling me how I screwed up some project in their community. And so I, I will say the lens has to shift and then there is nothing that replaces being a little bullheaded and a little stubborn so that people go, I don't wanna have to see River Mariama, so I'm just gonna try to do it this way. And then I, I will also say, I try to keep it interesting. Um, I, um, you know, I, I don't keep, like, I remember one year I, I have my godchildren, I love taking them strawberry picking and there was a meeting um, that was talking about um, uh, energy and uh, energy subsidies for um, middle income folks. And I took, brought my godson who had strawberry all over him. And I was like, everybody free, fresh picked Massachusetts strawberries. And now let's talk about the fact that this is not doing as much as it needs to be. Um, and so I think really that, that piece of building relationships, but being strong and, and saying, I'm gonna keep coming here until you hear the questions I'm asking in your brain before you put the policy out. 
um, because we need people to shift their approach. And I think the same thing is true for this crowd, you know, I, and I think I said this last night, we need to change our understanding of what we're doing, right? We are creating spaces of dwelling and belonging for people. We are helping people to be part of the economy and to be able to do the things that, that they um, need to do. We are helping build a movement towards solar. When you change your frame of what you're doing, then you, you, you can get, um, you find a balance between the actual tasks that need to get done because they're important. I want people to add the right numbers together and make sure the voltage is right because if all of those things are not right, you know, people's houses will burn down. Got to get that right. But if you're limited in thinking that's the only work that you're doing, um, then you can be very narrow. My parents were both medical doctors and all the time I was growing up, they reminded us that they were practicing a ministry of healing. That was the work that they were doing. Um, and that is a much larger frame than, you know, my dad sutured a lot. Of, he worked on the, on the Cape. So there were lots of accidents in the summer of people, you know, who got on a motorcycle with too much, you know, those kinds of things. But he, you, know, you always keep your bigger frame. What is, what is the work that I'm doing? Um, and then how do I understand how I, I, I'm doing that? And, I, and that's a lot of the work we're trying to get is to get very um, policy, minutia oriented folks to pull out their frame and ask a different set of questions so that we don't have to go back and fight them. We can actually work, we could be working together to make these stronger, to, to chart new paths and new territory because we all are in agreement that we're working from the bigger frame. And, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think any of these people are bad folks. They don't go home and say, let's just ruin the lives of lower low income people. Let's just make solar, you know, only for rich people. That's not what they're doing. They, but, because they don't widen their frame, they make decisions that functionally reinforce all of the inequities that already exist. Um, so I think you know, getting them to see what their job is is much bigger and getting them to ask those sets of questions before, um, that is what we hope for. And I think, you know, as Ben said, we're making some progress, but there is still a lot of work to do. Um, every once in a while, I even sing at, at, at hearings when they're really boring. And I'm like, we, we all need a little pick me up, you know, um, try to keep it, keep it interesting. Um, but it's a long haul. And so, um, really excited to see more and more people joining us and feeling like they are part of this mission, um, that we share. Perfect. Uh, Ben or, or Marcel, anything to add on, on the policy side of the world? All right. Did you, Ben? <laughs> oh, no, I was, um, I was shaking my head. Um, I think that's a nice one, so, right. Perfect. Um, so uh, the other kind of question um, came in uh, a couple of times. Um, for, for the projects you worked on, um, given policy changes that have occurred and, thing, and, and you know, where things stand now, um, uh, any plans to revisit and think about adding more panels or working on the, the community solar uh, element that, that wasn't feasible before? Um, has anything changed that, would, that might enable that yet? Or, or are we still waiting for the changes that would enable that? Well, we did write a bill and it's been tanked multiple times. Um, if you live in the district of Senator Barrett, he's been a, our, our um, deepest um, Detroit detractor, I think, around this bill, particularly because it includes race and not just class. Um, he would prefer that it only have class, not race. But um, we um, continue pushing. We've been working on other regulatory changes this year um, around the Department of Public Utilities. We're going to help them. Our big goal is to help them to put the public back in their name. That's my our big, big goal. And then um, we've been weighing in around the SMART program, trying to make that better. More engagement more listening than in the past. I'm not, um, you know, there, there were some changes that happened. Um, it, it maybe took a little too much pushing to get, uh, you know, the, those changes, but we're, we're glad and we're hoping that we can get to a point where there's sort of more proactive um, collaborative work around how we, um, we get there. Again, this still, there's still the mentality of trying to get the most um, solar possible. And so, Projects like Bethel still are not, the way that subsidies are currently set up, um, that doing the next side would be 
a little bit challenging um, because we'd have to, I mean, we did it for the other side, we have to redo the roof. Um, so I don't know um, how, we, we did have a conversation about it last year. After, right after we finished the first project, everyone was like, we need to take a little break. Um, they did have a conversation about last year. And I do know that it came up in the green team meeting, I think it was February and then COVID. So I, I'm not sure <laughs> um, where that's gonna, um, where that's gonna be, you know, and I think we'd again have to look at some of those, those regulations to make the, the um, payout more favorable because that was power we were gonna literally give away. Um, and so um, it would require some level of subsidy in order to make it happen. And I think we've, we have prioritized less fighting for the subsidy to be able to do that and prioritize more other kinds of um, projects. So it's not, it's not dead in the water. There's Bethel still open to it. Um, but when you look at the number of things that sort of that legislation sort of messed up, um, <laughs> we didn't put that at the top of the list of things um to fix although who knows we, we we have a laundry list of things we want to keep moving on so maybe that that will be possible but ben would you want to do a reprise of the of that project see if we can't uh, grow grow uh, some of those projects back out to what we originally um envisioned yeah yeah and you know and i and i think um uh you know as soon as uh as folks have the bandwidth for it right i think um one, one thing that's been really encouraging to me is um uh we, we did a set of projects we called the Solar Access Program, um, which um, was um, a bunch of residential properties um, uh, and, and uh, you know, homeowners um, in the, the area surrounding Second Church in Dorchester, um, but, but not wealthy people, um, you know, folks who had lived in, in, have, have lived in the neighborhood for generations in some cases and, and decades. Um, and, um, and that project is, um, is just one of the hardest projects we've ever developed. And these are all residential projects. You know, we've done complex commercial projects. So access program was the hardest to do 10 homes in Dorchester um, because um, folks have, um, you know, pre-existing um, electrical uh, issues with their houses in some cases or their older buildings or it's a denser um, area where it's harder to get access. And so you have to hire a crane to, to build a solar array on a, on a, on a triple decker. I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff like that. Um, super hard to develop. And, and, um, and, I, and Sunwell invested in that project as well. And, and I know that that was probably not the most lucrative project that Sunwell has invested in. And I had a great conversation with Marcel just like two or three weeks ago. And, and he was like, when are we gonna do the next solar access program? When are we gonna do phase three? Um, you know, and so I guess what my point is there is, is that like, we can keep sweating it out. Like we're gonna keep working on this. We're gonna keep pushing these types of projects through. They're not easy to do right now. They're super hard to do right now. And, um, and there is some level of subsidy there. Um, and it makes me super frustrated that, you know, I guess as a lot of the folks in the audience are probably aware, there's all these land use arguments happening um, about the solar policy right now where the folks out west are saying, okay, you know, enough 10 acre solar projects that are replacing forests in Western Massachusetts. We've got this like ugly situation where like the the, the Appalachian Mountain Club and, and the, the um, and, and like the trustees are fighting solar companies over what to use land for. And meanwhile, we're over here in Boston um, with all these roofs that would be perfect for solar. Um, you know, plenty of other examples like Second Church and like Bethel AME and like the solar access program projects. Um, and so I, I think the incentives are still really misaligned. Um, we've had um, uh, some progress. For example, they created a medium-sized project carve-out for projects 25 to 500 kilowatts um, in the SMART program, so that's helpful. But until we increase the absolute value of the incentives available to projects in environmental justice neighborhoods or in urban areas, um, then I think we're going to keep missing the issue. Um, and it's going to continue to be like, um, you know, how do you do that much extra work just to drive the same benefit to folks who live in environmental justice neighborhoods? Yeah, I, I would just add um, that with uh, the environmental justice neighborhoods, this this is a new change to the um, the regulation um, as of a couple of months ago, um, and it does it is a step in the in the right direction um, as as we're talking about incremental change. Um, and so, not only is environmental justice that that phrase now and 
referenced in a, a bill, but also um, kind of within the regulation within the smart policy right now as it exists, um, there is a kind of an expanded definition of what constitutes a, uh, a, a low income off taker for the purposes of some of the incentives. So that it's thinking not just about kind of a, a very difficult subsidized utility rate um, on, on which very few or some people are on, but there are majority of lots of people that um, are not on this rate um, that that could be that should be that um, just don't even know about it. And um, so there are a lot of access issues around that. Um, the DOER recently has um, kind of uh, re uh, or added additional language in, in the SMART program that has enabled um, any rate payer that lives within what they define as a, 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 a environmental justice neighborhood. Um, anyone that lives within this neighborhood can qualify as, as a low income um, uh, rate payer and, and thereby participate um, and kind of help incentivize um, that, that outreach a little bit more. So there, there are some incremental changes being done on that front. Um, I think low income community solar in particular um, is also a very um, much kind of overlooked and uh, like right now I, I, I took a look um, just quickly here at the, uh, the numbers on uh, that the policies website and um, about 3% of the overall kind of installed um, solar projects um, capacity right now in the state uh, across the state, only 3% of that um, are for low income community solar projects or low income property um, off takers. So there's, there's, there's a lot of work still to be done, obviously, to make sure that the, the regulations, because the regulations ultimately do define the framework in which the, the market works and does incentivize certain projects to get built and disincentivizes other projects to get built. And so there, there, there is still a ton of work to be done there to, to make sure that um, we are um, able to make the benefits um, more accessible and, and kind of distributed to um, low income communities in particular. And I, I want to just point one little thing is that whenever we're talking about low income you want to pay attention to how they're defining low income because um so one thing you know like the r2 rate and the electricity bill again everyone who gets that is definitely low income and there are lots of people who are not part of that program um but the other thing that can happen i have found is people will say low and moderate and in massachusetts moderate because of the way our income system sets up, moderate can be like $65,000, which I'm not saying people who make $65,000 don't need to help. It's just, I've, I've observed a few programs that help low and moderate income people. And I'm like, I wanna know how many of these people are low and how many of them are, I'm just saying, there's a lot that can happen with definitions um, to make things look better than they are or not, eligible to reach folks. So I do, you know, say a lot of times, pay attention to how things are being defined. Ask those questions um, because it may, you may find either that the assumption is a lot of people are being helped and one group of people is only being helped or um, it's so narrowly defined that it's helping people who are, who are super low. I, I'll use the example of one time I saw something that was gonna offer loans to lo low income people and it's like people who qualify for the R2 rate probably don't have the money. They won't get those loans because that you're living really close to, um, you know, you're living pretty paycheck to paycheck. And so that's an example of you can create a program that nobody can access it because it, it's built on getting people to take out loans, which means there'll be some assessment of their ability to pay. And the program that they're in is because they don't have any ability to pay. So just really paying attention to those kinds of design things and those kinds of definitions, um, because I have definitely seen them hurt. Um, even well-intentioned people set things up that um, create new kinds of donut holes or um, really are not well designed for most people um, because of the way those definitions are set up. Oh, jumping quickly off of that, one, one other, um... One of the thought I'll add is that um, there's a tendency in the policy to want to address, like create the widest possible category to do like the, to check the box for, for equity. Um, and so it's like low and moderate income is sort of the, like, you know, the most watered down version of that. Um, 
I think sometimes I am also guilty of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about like low income communities and communities of color, like in one phrase, like that's sort of a monolith. Um, and I think it's important to actually separate that out um, and, and noting that um, in Massachusetts and also nationwide in the United States, um, a study just came out from UC Berkeley and Tufts um, about a year ago showing that even when you control for income um, and in and, and, and neighborhoods of the same income where the only difference is whether it's a majority white community versus a majority black community, majority black communities have uh, something like 87% fewer solar installations uh, than majority white communities. Um, and so I think really critical to remember that in the policies that we're creating, um, we just can't afford to create like a race blind policy. So it's like it's very helpful and we have to have targeted programs that focus on the income question. But I think we also need to be really serious about how we're addressing race, noting that the way that the programs have been carried out, irrespective of people's income, um, have been primarily focused on bringing benefits to majority white communities and have not been successful in serving majority black communities. Um, and, you know, I think more to discuss on, on that than, than we may have time for now, but, but I, I hope that's um, something that people bear in mind. Excellent, everyone. Thank you. Um, so uh, we only have 10 minutes left, so I want to get in one more question uh, and also just a reminder for folks. Uh, there's another poll question down at the bottom uh, that's kind of a... Uh, uh, reflective look uh, after hopefully thinking about these topics for the last uh, hour and a half um, on kind of what's the action you, you hope you can take home um, uh, and, and bring to your own work. Um, and so for the panelists uh, kind of on that topic, um, what is your kind of why uh, for, a, for a company, for any of the kind of companies here today um, uh, who are working in this clean energy space uh, on why they should kind of take that deliberate and uh, and, and kind of uh, focused action to, to, uh, to work on inclus inclusivity uh, in their work, uh, you know, beyond going just back and, and doing the business as usual as they've been operating. So uh, what is that why uh, that, that people can leave with? Okay, well, I guess I can jump in. I think, um, so, you know, there is the obvious that it's like the right thing to do, <laughs> um, that we as a, a nation, um, I mean, I think, I think what shocked everyone about the death of George Floyd is yeah, it was for officers. But, but I think what we all viscerally knew is um, there's something wrong um, when people think that that's okay. They, they knew people were videotaping them and they just kept going anyway. And, and they did because we have all been complicit in creating a society where that's okay, where some people's lives matter and others don't. Um, and so I think that there, there is a place and space in which we do it because it's the right thing to do. I also think for those of us who believe that we need solar, um, to take off and to radically replace fossil fuels, how is that going to happen if we're not figuring out how to bring it to every possible place and person who needs it? And so um, working in this narrow way is, is a sh counterproductive to wanting to get the kind of true saturation that we say we know we need. Um, and, and so I think that there's that. I think there's also the reality that if you can figure out how to do some things that other people haven't done. You also have the probability of creating a niche for yourself. Um, and it will be hard. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. Um, but I think, you know, someone, you know, people do call me as a reference for residents who are like, once you've done one or two, you also create an opportunity to do many more. Resident is doing now as many, um, you know, houses of worship, you know, and a quarter as we did <laughs> in that like 18 months before. Um, and so there is a payoff on the other side of that. Um, so I think, I think, you know, from the big picture of our moral responsibility um, all the way to um, being able to build a bottom line around something um, that you will specialize in. The truth is there are not that many people who are doing it. So there's not that many people who know how to do it. So if you get out there and figure out how to do it, um, you will have a lot of 
business opportunities um, because it is an under um, uh, underutilized and under um, uh, sort of capitalized space. So I think there's those would be my um, three reasons. But I I have to say for myself personally that first reason is probably um, the biggest, and I I would say is it's probably the biggest in this moment where all of us have had a little bit more time to recognize our own vulnerability and to see the fragility of the world that we're in. And I think many of us are asking the question, what the heck am I doing about this? And what can I be doing more? And um, sometimes I think people think like, I have to go volunteer over here. I have to quit my job and become something else. And the reality is you don't have to leave the field you're in. Take that lens off um, that, that's you know, prevented you from seeing and then see all the opportunities for equity and justice in the solar world. Um, all the opportunities to do better on labor, all the opportunities to think about design better. Um, there's so many opportunities to, to um, bring justice into everything we do. It doesn't need to be a job that's, that's performed by a few of us. If all of us started doing it, our world would be radically transformed. Uh, man, we, we should have um, should have let Reverend Mariana go last, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I really I really agree with that. I mean that that is um, probably put some of my own motivations better than I could put it myself. Um, and, and that's true also to say that Reverend Mariana has been a continual inspiration to me personally in my own um, you know trajectory in this field of, of seeing how she does what she does. So um, you know just want to acknowledge that um, and and appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, for, for me, I was, uh, it was 2014, um, I was um, working on a large scale um, anaerobic digestion project in China um, uh, as a, as a, under a Fulbright scholarship. Um, that was around the time that um, Trayvon Martin was murdered. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I was, I, I remember, it's like, it was in the news, it was in, I was, the, the, there was an album, Kendrick Lamar was talking about it. And I, I think I, I sort of started to think at that time, Between the World and Me came out, um, and I started to wonder why I was in um, China. Um, and I think for, for me, um, you know, simply put, I, I, um, I started to be not proud that I was uh, an American and not because as, as an American in China, but because of the America that was my country. Um, I really wanted to play a bigger part in um, living in a country that I felt proud to live in, which is, which is not currently the case um, with a lot of aspects of the United States. Um, uh, so for me personally, it's like I just want to be doing work that that helps contribute to a country that is more like one that I would be proud to to live in, um, and and that um, you know comes both when it comes to issues of um, of racial justice, but with renewable energy, you know I think this is a big um, it's a big thing. It's like um, having more people involved is not a liability; it's an asset. Um, having more people involved means there's more people voting for clean energy policies. It means there's a broader base. It means there's more people to invest in it. There's more customers to buy it. Um, so I think that's a, another takeaway for me is, um, you know, more people is a good thing. And I, I want to do my part to, to help achieve that. Yeah, and I guess um, since we're taking a, a personal approach here, um, for me, it's um, yeah, I also kind of grew up in in a different culture where it was um, a little just what was considered to be the norm recycling glass by color, for example, that, that was completely normal. Um, and I remember moving here and um, there there was no recycling um, in, in the street. No, people didn't really know about it. But, and so I think um, my, my motivation is um, in thinking about this more imperative that Reverend Mariama just mentioned, um, thinking about how can we normalize that? How can we make it so that um, this, this isn't uh, seen as a challenge, as an obstacle, this isn't seen as like a, a reach, a goal, a target for us to hit, but this is just part of daily life and becomes normalized. Um, and, and like similar, I guess, just thinking about that story back of, of Rep Holmes pointing to the second church and seeing that those panels up there are, are normal for that community, it just blends right in. Um, that's kind of the, the future that um, I, I, I strive and, and work towards. And um, for me, the why is, is, is really kind of that moral, that moral imperative to, to make it um, normative. Um, and, and then I guess 
in an optimistic way, if, if we want to think about it optimistically, I, I do think the world is is changing. Um, we are um, waking up. We are far uh, very different than we were just four or five years ago when this this project um, that we just were talking about first kind of began and was being contemplated. And um, I, I would like to think that you know if um, the moral imperative isn't enough, if the economic growth opportunities aren't enough, then um, at some point in that society will move and progress beyond the point where if you're not kind of ahead of the curve or on the curve, you're just going to be left behind as, as a company that's not um, kind of implementing and changing and, and thinking about kind of equity and, and these um, issues that are very much important. Excellent. Thank you, uh, all three of you. Um, so we're at 2.30, so uh, I think we can wrap everything up. Um, there was a few questions that, that came in right at the end that we didn't necessarily get to, but uh, really appreciate it, everyone. Um, and uh, thanks, everyone, for, for attending. Um, hope it was all useful, and I and, uh, hope you enjoyed the, the other uh, interesting and informative panels. Brooks just mentioned one in the chat, but there's uh, a lot of other sessions uh, at Nessie focused on these great issues. So uh, uh, with that, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.